The history of mass media stretches back to prehistoric times, beginning with forms of art and writing. In 776 BC, results from the first Olympic Games in Athens were announced by carrier pigeons carrying messages. By the 9th century AD, basic printing technology existed, handwritten in the forms of books. Gutenberg is credited with inventing the printing press in the mid-15th century, and the first weekly printed newspaper was in Belgium in 1605. Then daily newspapers were introduced in England in the early 18th century. Marconi began experimenting with electromagnetic waves in the late 19th century and sent the first radio signals across the Atlantic Ocean in December 1901. Five years later, on Christmas Eve 1906, the first radio broadcast using amplitude modulation, or AM, was made by Canadian-born Reginald Fessenden. Good evening. This is Professor Reginald A. Fessenden, speaking to you from Brant Rock, Massachusetts. By 1922, BBC made its first radio broadcast, which someone forgot to record. But we had sound in the airwaves. Then we had images. The first television broadcast of any kind was by John Logie Baird in 1925. The BBC made its first television broadcast in 1936. Hello, Radio Olympia. This is direct television from the studios at Alexander Palace. And now you're going to see and hear someone you know well. That same year at the Berlin Olympics, American sprinter Jesse Owens sat down with German radio hosts to be interviewed. Mr. Owens, how do you like the Olympic Village? Does it shoot you well? Oh. well? I think the Olympic Village is one of the seven wonders of the world. By 1952, millions watched live television for the first time, the coronation of Elizabeth II. And she puts on the great golden mantle, the imperial robe. Receive this imperial robe. And the Lord your God endure you. Then in 1969. As one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. At the same time, in the late 1960s, dozens of scientists, programmers, and engineers began developing what we now call the Internet. They were building from ideas by Nikola Tesla back in the early 1900s when he imagined a world wireless system. Tim Berners-Lee is credited with inventing the World Wide Web in 1990. In 1998, Larry Page and Sergey Brin renamed their little-known search engine Backrub to Google. And today, we have search engines, email, websites, podcasts, video blogs, mobile apps, you name it. And we still have traditional mass media. Technology has enabled mass communication to be faster, wider, louder, more influential for good and bad. Today on Stories and Strategies, we speak with Marty Forbes, a media veteran with more than a half century of experience, about where mass media has been and where it may be going. My name is Doug Downs. Hello, Marty. Hello, Doug. Nice to hook up again. Yes, yes. Long time. I'm glad we finally been able to. Marty is an icon in Canadian broadcasting, having worked in radio in Edmonton, in Calgary, Toronto, Vancouver, Lethbridge, and Kamloops. He is a winner of the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Award for Community Service. He's the president of RadioWise Inc. Consulting in both traditional and new media today, does work with the John Cameron Changing Lives Foundation, and is a regular columnist in the Edmonton Sun. And Marty, you celebrated that amazing milestone I mentioned uh, very recently in the spring of 2020 here, 50, five zero years in the business. So what was 1970 like? <laughs> I like to tell people, I said, I can tell you the price of Kraft dinner on June 1st, 1970, because it was seven 
It was seven for a dollar. And the reason I remember that so vividly is there were seven days of the week. So yeah, it was 50 years ago. And I've used the phrase, it was a romp, Doug. I'm from a radio family. My late father, Jerry Forbes, started Ched in the, in the 50s. And I knew at age 14, I wanted to be in radio. So over that span, I worked in the, in the heyday of Top 40 radio. CanCon Rules and I actually started at the same time. The evolution and then the movement into FM radio, new formats, and now the digital age where exciting new things are happening in, in broadcast and journalism fields and, and podcasting, blogging, whatever. And picked up a couple of awards along the way, traveled the world, met some incredible people, somehow stayed married to the same woman for almost 40 years now have two great kids and one very cool grandson. So in a nutshell, yeah, it's been a romp. Awesome. And you've, you mentioned you've seen some of the changes. You know, what, what I hope we get to through this podcast is, are the changes really different this time? Or are they, it, it's just new technologies. You saw the, the migration from AM to FM in radio is the migration. And it's not from radio to podcasts, uh, to be very clear. But podcasts are a layer on top of that. Is the change really different? You know what, it, it, it's all, I call it, it's all in the delivery method. It's still journalism, it's still broadcasting, it's how we get it and where we receive it. I mean, we grew up with legendary broadcasters and, and TV people on television, icons that are gonna stay with us forever. And AM turned into FM, and FM turned into podcasting, World Wide Web and digital, but the commonality is, it's still, it's still the message and how it gets out there and how it's delivered. And now the choice is just absolutely immense okay is it fair to say that in the 70s and 80s and and maybe a bit of the 90s there were three main forms of mass media and that each had their distinct place newspapers were usually first with the information and even the thought leadership in the form of editorials radio really quick and adaptable in that you could broadcast as easily as picking up a phone and that television was was really the place where you saw the film or the video of the information that you kind of already knew so newspapers were were handheld and you got that background on everything happening around you because there were so few, so few choices in media, those entities became really, really powerful. Ched, for example, was the was you know the number one station in Edmonton with what was called a 55 share. You'd have to have five or six stations now to reach those same amount of people. And with newspapers, they were giants. I mean, the Edmonton Journal, the Calgary Herald, for example, were absolute giants, and they were led by by editors and publishers that were just icons in the community. You know, they, they were totally involved in, in fundraising and business and were the leaders in that. And you, you hit the nail on the head. We congregated to these various forms and newspaper was uh, the top of the pops for that congregation. Let, let's play a quick clip. This is from the BBC series, Yes, Prime Minister. In this scene, Prime Minister Jim Hacker is explaining to Sir Humphrey, his advisor, that he has decided to respond to a scandal brewing in the papers. I suppose the origin of this criticism is this rumor about another big scandal in the city. How did you guess? Oh, Humphrey, I've decided to respond to all this criticism about a scandal in the city. The press is demanding action. What are you proposing to do? I shall appoint someone. And when did you take this momentous decision? Today, when I read the papers. But when did you first think of it? Today, when I read the papers. <laughs> and for how long, may I ask, did you weigh the pros and cons of this decision? Not long. I decided to be decisive. Uh, Prime Minister, if I may say, I think you worry too much about what the papers say. <laughs> Only a civil servant could have made that remark, Bernard. <laughs> I have to worry about them, particularly with the party conference coming up. These rumours of a scandal just won't go away, you know. Well, let's not worry about it until it becomes something more than a rumour. I'd just like to show you the Cabinet agenda. No, not just now. For this is rather more important. With respect, Prime Minister, it is not. The only way to understand the press is to remember that they pander to their readers' prejudices. Don't tell me about the press. I know exactly who reads the papers. The Daily Mirror is read by people who think they run the country. The Guardian is read by people who think they ought to run the country. <laughs> the Times is read by the people who actually do run the country. <laughs> Daily Mail is read by the wives of the people who run the country. <laughs> the Financial Times is read by people who own the country. <laughs> the Morning Star is read by people who think the country ought to be run by another country. <laughs> and the Daily Telegraph is read by people who think it is. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, well before that horrible term, uh, fake news. 
to this day, I still have the Toronto Telegram from uh, the JFK assassination, from the first landing on the moon, Winston Churchill leaving, and we believed everything was gospel, you know, for many, many years because the newspaper had such a wonderful, credible reputation, and that that has really changed. So, so why did it change? Why didn't newspaper stay the top of the pops in mass media? Um, it, what, what changed with newspapers, everything is revenue based. And when it starts to falter, things fall apart. So believe it or not, when you talk to newspaper, the newspaper people these days, the first huge impact was on cl the loss of classified ads. That was a huge amount of revenue. And of course, that all moved to Kijiji's and, and places like that. So that, that took a big lump out of it. As at the same time, technology was changing. And I, I think it's our, you know, our generation, the baby boomers saying, you know, I don't care about yesterday's news anymore. I can get today's news right here, right? And it's, it's funny in dealing with a lot of my, uh, my generation, I'm, I'm a bit of an anomaly in, in the digital world. They're all mad at this media. And I said, well, let me sit you down and, and I'll teach you how to, to build a flipboard or I'll teach you how to get onto Twitter with push notices. My, my kids design the news that they want to hear to come to them. And with a push notice or, or you know, uh, an alert on, on their telephones, they're quite often getting hold of me really quickly. Hey, dad, this is happening or that's going on such and such. So it's a whole generational change in the way that newspapers are used. And, you know, picking up yesterday's paper now just doesn't make as much sense as it did my mom's generation. But my theory, you tell me if you think differently. My theory is mass communication really hasn't changed. It has decentralized for sure, but we're still tweaking the same senses. What I hear, what I see, what I read. Well, the, the most powerful thing you have right now is a cell phone, a smartphone. That's your radio station, your television station, your on-demand, your newspapers, your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram. I, I joke, I, I go to Europe every single year and I don't even put a, a, a bounce back on my, uh, on my email anymore because you want to get a hold of me floating down the Danube, you can't, right? You don't, <laughs> the world is a really small place. And when you walk into places, I just, I have this great new client and, and they came after me. They're all 55, 65 year old guys. They're not on any digital platform whatsoever. So I said, guys, I'm going to sound like an alien when I start chatting with you. And I'm going to give you a great example of how powerful this is. That's right in front of your faces. When you look at a hockey game and look right behind the bench and there's people sitting in the $500 a pair of seats and they're on their cell phones during the game. What does that tell you guys? And it's quite funny because after the meetings, there's 10, eight to 10 guys in there. My phone's starting to light up an email. Hey, can we talk to you? Can you come talk to our group? Because they're just, they're having that hard time in the transition understanding. And I'm doing mostly programmatic buying for my clients. And it's just absolutely fascinating how quickly it's growing. You and I are doing a podcast and most people listening are listening on their phones. We're, we're essentially doing radio. What is it? Why is radio so consistent and has been, I mean, since the 70s when, when you came about, radio just it has its dips, but it, it never has its valleys. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the most personal of mediums. It's, it's the one-on-one -on -one medium. It's, it's when you're alone, it's your friend. If you need information, it's there. And in the, in the 70s, I was so lucky to grow up with, in a radio family because I was just surrounded by the absolute best talent. Len Tucson had a radio show back in the 70s that people still talk about. And Bob McCord was an afternoon drive guy in Edmonton that they, they still talk about. Wes Montgomery's been gone you know, almost 10 years now. His name shows up anytime there's something going on in the city. But there are people that, that have their favorite announcers or favorite shows. And you, know, you, you take something like Kissing, that's a lifestyle. And Chris Sheets and the guys do just such a great job of relating to that, to that lifestyle with the country. And that's very, that's very powerful stuff. You're so right. It's so personal. Um, and two of our mutual colleagues that we both know are the reasons I think I got into broadcasting. One, Bob McGee in Toronto, who was at Ched for a time. Right. And another fellow you may know, Jerry Forbes. Okay, time for another clip. It was inevitable we would play something from WKRP in Cincinnati, distributed through CBS Television. This is one of the first scenes from the pilot episode in 1978 with Dr. Johnny Fever changing the radio station's format rather abruptly. Goodbye to the elevator music. <laughs> Mr. 
because I got the healing prescription here from the big KRP musical medicine cabinet. Now, I am talking about your 50,000 watt intensive care unit, babies. So just sit right down, relax, open your ears real wide and say, give it to me straight, doctor. I can take it. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to ask you about that style of broadcast. It's basically the style Wolfman Jack adopted in the 1960s, what is that? And why was it popular in radio? Well, radio is all about entertainment. And the, the top 40 era, for example, was a generation trying to have fun. And those 70s radio stations, as you mentioned earlier, the, his amplitude modulation, they would cover a very, very large geographic area, depending on where the transmitter power or transmitter was and the power. And if you had something like a clear channel station, for example, you could hear from, you know, stations from Chicago, Salt Lake City, Vancouver over the air at night. The WKRPs of life, although a parody wasn't far off the mark, <laughs> there, there was a great deal of fun in the building, expressed on the air. Celebrities used to drop into the stations all the time. I, I interviewed the Eagles one time. I, I tried to interview Monty Python. It was hilarious because I, I talked to them for 20 minutes, didn't get one single clip I could use. And it was all, it was all about fun and entertainment and irreverence. And, and it was just a wonderful era. Who did you interview from Monty Python? That's fantastic. I did the entire crew, and I'll try to keep this as short as I can, but back then it was a boom mic. So we all sat around in a circle, and the boom mic meant you had to move it to whoever was going to answer that question. So I said, okay, guys, I'm going to ask the question. Somebody put up your hand. Who wants to answer the question? So I had asked the question, and I, I adored them. And the guy would put up his hand. I'd move the microphone over. Somebody else would answer the question. So they had to move the, move the boom over to that guy. When it came over to him, the original guy would answer the question, move it back. This went on for literally 20 minutes, and I never got one single clip. I looked over at them, and I said, I'm not going to get a single thing, am I? And they just said, nope. Oh, they were geniuses. That's great. It was, it was, it was fascinating. The original Top 40, basically, or, or the boom in radio, happened when it came out of your living room. If you remember going to grandma's house, they had one radio. It was either in the living room or the kitchen. And you listened to that one radio. When the transistor radio was invented and Elvis Presley and rock and roll hit, that meant we had our own lifestyle, our own music, and that racket to our parents. The same thing has happened with the digital age. When you think of the boom, it all really happened again with a smartphone when you can take, you know, I used to carry 5,000 CDs around when I moved. Now I've got a, you know, seven ounce <laughs> a handheld phone that I can access anywhere in the world. You and I grew up in different places, slightly different generations, but I, I've always thought you and I are very similar spirits. As kids, we both loved radio deeply. It could have been broadcasting in any form of mass media. What do you say to young people today? Is this still something that a young person should consider as a career? Absolutely. I'm, I'm really proud that I was the, uh, the uh, chair of the Nate Broadcasting uh, School for 15 years. We did some very innovative things with, uh, with the, grade, the, the second year class where we'd bring them into the station and spend the entire day with them, letting them wander around, sit in the control rooms, let them meet the morning show, talk to the program directors, and really show them what a really successful radio station looked like. The last couple of years, I've been the digital director for the Grey Cup Festival. And we made the kids in the class apply for the opportunities. So five or six of them did. We interviewed them like it was a real job application. And as part of the role of helping us get the word out to, to the entire country about the Grey Cup Festival is they got a, a reference at the end of it. So it's still a very, I mean, very exciting business. You get to meet people. You get to do, you know, really, really novel stuff. 
My dad used to use the term, it says it makes you half smart. I mean, you don't know a lot about a little bit, you know a little bit about a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of sentences deep on just about anything. Yeah, exactly. I, I love that we were able to get together here, Marty. And I also love how you've embraced the new technologies. I, I mean it, that, that experience that you've got in mass media and understanding the millions of channels that are out there now, that is so valuable uh, to so many of your clients. So thank you. Your time was valuable today. I, I really appreciate it. Just really quickly, I, I decided when my dad passed away at age 58 that I was going to retire at 58, which I did. I flew down to Phoenix, spent 90 days down there saying, you know, I still have gas in the tank. What am I going to do? And I reinvented myself and said, I better stay with the flow that's going here. I better learn. And it's opened up so many doors. Uh, I just have so much fun, you know, building digital platforms and working with people and understand the power of it. So this, this helps me get my message aside or across as well, which I appreciate it. That's inspiring. If you'd like to send a message to my guest, Marty Forbes, you can email him at m. Forbes, Forbes, just like the magazine, by the way, mforbes07 at shaw.ca. If you liked what you heard today, we're hoping you choose to follow and rate this podcast on Apple Podcasts. Also, would you do us a favor and recommend this podcast to one friend? And if you have an idea for an episode or just want to tell us something, send us a note at info at jgrcommunications.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you.